It's a good morning, October the 30th, 2014. This is CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Today is day number 20 into week number 10. So let's get started. Welcome back to today's class. Remember, we've given you the information on the hacktivism, or better say the anonymous group, on the Monday class. And today we would like to continue with a little bit of these documentary, but from a different perspective, and then I would invite individual team to come up here to do your team breaks and sharing. Alright? Um, let's get started. Attack of the hacktivists. Alright? And joining us now on the debate in Austin, Texas, Barrett Brown, former spokesperson for the activist group Anonymous, now with Project EM. In time. Washington, D.C., Joseph Mann, reporter at the Financial Times and the author of Fatal System Error. In New York, New York, Gabriella Coleman, assistant professor of media, culture, person. and communication at NYU. And with us here in studio, Stefania Milan, with the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab. And I'm happy, first of all, to welcome everybody to the program tonight. And second of all, I want to just clap at the brain gain we've got going here in Canada. Gabriella, you're moving to McGill University in a few months. We're really glad to hear about that. And Stefania, you've just moved here from? Hungary. Hungary. And you've been here all of three weeks, so we're glad about that. You're a U of T now. That's great. Okay, let's start. Uh, Joseph, start us out with this. Um, I suspect there are some of our viewers who just need a bit of a crash course in what hacktivism is all about. So give us your best definition, if you like. Yeah, all right. Uh, let's see. Hacktivism is a combination of computer hacking and activism. And it's actually something that dates back, oh, more than a decade. Uh, but it was historically a bit more of um, sort of the prankster variety. And uh, occasionally there'd be hacking for uh, sake of embarrassing a major company, um, uh, particularly Microsoft or other big uh, technology companies. Um, people people who, are, who are really pretty geeky and interested in security would find a gaping security hole. They couldn't convince the maker of the software to fix it. And then they'd embarrass them by uh, walking, walking through it and uh, uh, pilfering out whatever they they could get. Um, that's that's sort of one of the, the major origins of it. And then uh, the more recent era hacktivism, which, which is getting wide attention now, dates to I'd say early last year when uh, Scientology managed to offend uh, some uh, online bulletin board users um, by trying to get a video banned. Uh, and these people sort of rallied around it, um, and uh, this is the, the origins of the, the modern version of Anonymous, uh, which people have hopefully heard of by now. Uh, and they, uh, they began to do uh, organize real-world events, uh, get a lot of publicity, uh, and this is where the Guy Fox masks comes from. And eventually they, they sort of adopted uh, uh, interests that were more, more real-world than that, uh, e.g. repression in places like Tunisia, uh, and, and helped activists there. So it, it, it sort of began in the virtual world and has, has moved into the mainstream world. Okay, Gabrielle, let me follow up with you. Is it, is it, I mean, it, it started as kind of pranksterish and that kind of thing, but uh, is there a more constructive angle to it today that you think activists are involved with? Well, uh, when it comes to anonymous, uh, the term hacktivism on the one hand definitely applies because some of their techniques do relate to questions of uh, sometimes breaking into a, a computer or using uh, distributed denial of service um, attack. Uh, but they also use a lot of sort of tactics that have nothing to do with hacking or hackers, and a lot of people involved are also wouldn't identify as such. I think one of the interesting things about Anonymous is that, first of all, it's a name that anyone can take. So there's different groups or nodes or wings or arms that are sometimes unconnected. And then the second element is, um, just as Joseph has said, on the one hand, they've become uh, a little bit more political, but they've also never let go fully of their kind of rowdy, pranksterish kind of roots as well. More on Anonymous in a second. Ste Stefania, can you give us, give us a couple of examples, if you would, of the kinds of activities that hacktivists have gotten in trouble for? Yeah, well, uh, these activists are in, in a way innovative because they bring direct action into cyberspace. But the new element there is cyberspace in the sense that a lot of the actions that you see online are actually very similar to what you will see offline. For example, sit-ins that become virtual sit-ins or blockades in the same way in which you would sit in front of, say, Sony Corporation if you have to protest against some policies of the, of the company. Um, 
these people do it online by blocking the, the virtual gates, so uh, the, the website of uh, the company. But cybercrime sounds very nefarious and dangerous. Is that what we're talking about here when we talk about hacktivists? When we look about defensive and offensive tactics, and I guess that some of the more offensive tactics definitely fall under the umbrella definition of cybercrime. I don't quite like that though, and I'm sure that many of these activists those actually object to this definition. They don't like being called cyber criminals. No. No. Okay. Because they have a political agenda behind that. So it's not only about disrupting, but there is a reason why you do that. It's not greed. Okay, Barrett, you're the guy who used to be involved with Anonymous, so we want to sort of pick your brains for a little bit here and find out uh, more about them. And again, I, I don't want to start from the assumption that everybody knows who they are, because after all, they are Anonymous. So, let's start there. Who are they? Well, Anonymous, the culture grew out of this, uh, this very unusual and unique uh, other culture, uh, starting at a message board called 4chan, which gained popularity in 2003-2004. Uh, and then, of course, in 2000, early 2008, you had the Scientology uh, campaign, which was really the first, the first activist-oriented uh, action conducted by Anonymous, you know, which had been preceded by a number of, uh, of occasions in which you see similar techniques, but directed uh, more, more for fun. You know. uh, I, I think, uh, as, you know, as, as Gabriella, I think, alluded, uh, Gabriella, even aside from the hacking, which of course is a major component and always probably will be of anonymous and, and similar groups, you, I think the fundamental unit here is, is information warfare. Uh, not the majority of people who are have been working on these campaigns in the last couple of years are not hackers and don't have those those skill sets. Uh, rather, the, the, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of new techniques being developed in, by, by which to use information uh, in order to achieve a goal. And how did you get involved in these guys? Attention. Well, I uh, started a group called Project PM back in 2009 that sort of had similar objectives uh, to, to what Anonymous would, would eventually come to itself. And then uh, well, I was in discussions with Anonymous participants uh, for that for a while. Then when Tunisia started, uh, I was brought in by Greg Howe. She was the, one of the people who, who started the Scientology campaign previously and also provided advice uh, to other Anonymous afterwards. Uh, since this was something I've been talking about, the, the inevitable uh, conflict between these procedural groups that are um, you know, using, using the online world as their environment uh, versus traditional institutions, which in many, which in many cases are, I think, I think are losing their credibility. Uh, and so at that point, we, we did quite a bit uh, in the very beginning of the Arab Spring, uh, and, and I think made some very good predictions, especially relative to what else was being said by more traditional pundits. And uh, afterwards, I uh, continued to be involved in the legal defense uh, after the raids began in the U.S. and U.K. And uh, afterwards, and right now what I do is I still collaborate with some anonymous uh, participants uh, within my own group, Project PM, with the goal of acquiring more information and, and bringing attention to what's called the intelligence contracting industry, which okay. uh, I'll talk about I'm sure later on. Sure. Joseph, uh, let me follow up with you. How effective do you think all of these techniques have been? Um, well, in, in many cases, they've been very effective. I mean, there, there are some, um, depending on what, you, what you're after. I mean, I think in some ways, politically, if you're looking at it from the traditional uh, lens of uh, political change, uh, Iran was, was a disaster. Uh, it was a, also a disaster for, I guess, traditional Western intelligence and folks like that that were probably trying to help the rebels there. Um, uh, some people in Anonymous uh, helped the dissidents in Iran, and unfortunately, they were rounded up and, and mostly uh, arrested and killed. Uh, so that wasn't good. Um, Egypt and Tunisia, I, you know, I, I think they've been a part of the process that really helped those revolutions uh, come to power, or at least get rid of the old power. Um, in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. and elsewhere, you know, they've been very effective at helping spread the word, uh, spread awareness, either through... Uh, the denial of service attacks, which are, are like these mass sit-ins where they uh, make websites uh, inaccessible and that generates headlines. Um, so, and in amplifying Occupy Wall Street, I, I think they, they help they have helped spread the word about Occupy Wall Street. I don't think they're the ones that came up with it, but they're they're very good at using Twitter uh, and other uh, and YouTube and other you know newer forms of communication to spread the word about what a given issue is and what people are doing about it. So I think they've been very effective. Gabrielle, you are uh, in the shadow of Wall Street right now, so I should ask you this question. How influential and or effective do you think they've been in what's been transpiring there over the last couple of weeks? 
Well, there's two elements, uh, just to echo uh, Joe, who put it very well. They're, they're very good at getting media attention. In some ways, what I find so fascinating about them is that they're in the tradition of the Yippies and Abby Hoffman or the Yes Men, except they're far more populist in some ways, since anyone can contribute. Um, and sometimes their hacks of the media are not quite as elegant, um, and yet they're very, very effective. And, and I think Occupy Wall Street is a great example of that. Uh, definitely Occupy Wall Street has become a very large phenomenon with many different um, groups and stakeholders participating in many different parts of the world. And uh, Anons, some, some very um, active Anons are very active on the ground in different cities, obviously not necessarily revealing who they are. And then uh, a number of Anons who are very technically oriented are helping out on uh, technical working groups on internet relay chat as well. Stefania, I should ask you about that because we started the program by saying these aren't your grandmother's street protesters in the traditional sense of the word. These are not hippies? Is there a generational difference here between then and what's going on today? Yeah, in my opinion there's definitely a generational difference there. And, uh, and that should also um, correct our speaker from New York, I think, because uh, actually uh, hacktivism, as we know it now, became much more visible with Anonymous, so starting in 2009, but uh, originated actually in the second half of the 90s, where some more arty groups tried to foster a political agenda mm -hmm. within the hacker community, which by definition wouldn't be very uh, politically aware or much more interested uh, into uh, issues related to the politics of the internet, so only of the cyberspace, leaving out uh, what happens out in the streets, um, uh, if you want. Uh, what I see out there, and I've been studying activists, uh, radical internet activists, for the last five, six years, and I see a big generational gap between the anonymous uh, generation and the older hackers. And in a way, you even see a funny attitude by the older hackers who mm, are kind of dismissive towards these newer um, gigs, how they call them. Dismissive? Yeah. How come? Uh, well, they believe that um, they are somehow at odds with uh, the so-called hacker ethics. And uh, they also believe they're not extremely good at what they do. So they think that they play some more tricks rather than actually real technical um, expert uh, type or of um, actions. Gotcha. And one big uh, difference there is, for example, in the attitude towards the media, towards visibility. So the older hackers uh, would not uh, seek uh, visibility through the media. Actually, their ta tactics would be much more clandestine. Um, and this, you know, is something that, has, uh, that is visible also in the fact that uh, present time activists are much more, uh, are much less aware, sorry, of uh, surveillance and privacy uh, risks related to action online. And in fact, they might be anonymous, but the FBI was able to track them down. Hmm. I'm going to read Barrett something out of the San Francisco Chronicle from a couple of months ago and then get you to comment on it. This is about activities that took part uh, on the left coast of your country. The amorphous hacker group known as Anonymous made good Sunday on its threat to strike the Bay Area rapid transit system, breaching an agency website and releasing customers' personal information in retaliation for BART's decision to cut cellular phone service to prevent an anti-police protest in San Francisco. The hack attack sent BART scrambling to protect its websites, and it infuriated some riders whose information was leaked. It came as the hackers also called for a 5 p.m. protest today at BART's Civic Center station, where a police officer fatally shot a knife-wielding man on July the 3rd. Uh, okay, let's start with this, Barrett. What do you think of that action that the hacktivists did, that Anonymous did, uh, against Bart? Well, one of the phrases we like to use is that anonymous, uh, anonymous is not unanimous. And well, what that means is there's, there's no charter, there's no leadership, there's no official titles, uh, and there's, there's, there's not always agreements on tactics and objectives. Uh, in this case, this was an action that was very popular among some anons and not entirely popular among others. Uh, having said that, you know, when you have situations where they release, uh, where someone releases information, personal information of innocence, uh, that's something to, that's worth criticizing. Uh, there's, there's obviously plenty to criticize within any movement and any group. Uh, I think that, that I think those actions also have to be looked, looked at in context. Uh, if, if one criticizes anonymous, as one should, 
one should also look at the context that they're operating. I mean, this is a context in which we have 40 of our alleged participants having been uh, raided with guns drawn by FBI agents for having allegedly participated in a DDoS attack against a corporate website. So, and that's obviously just the, just the small of, of what's going on in the world. So, yeah, of course, uh, so there's been a number of things that some people have done that should not have been done. Given that last thing, Gabrielle, that uh, Barrett just said, uh, do you have any sympathy for the tactics of Anonymous in this case? I'm not sure if um, the question of sympathy is exactly the way I would put it. I mean, I'm an anthropologist who studies Anonymous, so I get quite... I get in the trenches with, with Anonymous, right? And obviously, I've chosen to study them because I think that they're fascinating, both anthropologically and politically. And actually, those issues are quite different. And I think when it comes to the politics of Anonymous, which is a little bit different from the anthropological dynamics I study, um, there's moments where I do the facepalm as well. I cringe. And, and, and in some ways, I uh, find what they do problematic, but also the fact that um, they're so hard to predict and the fact that they're not unanimous is precisely why I also think they're powerful. And then also, uh, I think when it comes to certain forms of, of their kind of interventions, it, it opens a window into kind of larger political questions, which I'm afraid if I go into, I'm gonna talk for a long time, but these are definitely worth addressing. And, and as a citizen, I can't but help be compelled by some of the questions that Anonymous is put on the table. Well, let me go to Joe on that then. Did, is there anything about that Bay Area rapid transit situation that you found defensible in terms of Anonymous's conduct? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an objective journalist type, so I don't have opinions on things like this. I'll say that we, uh, we mentioned um, criticism uh, from older generation um, activist hacker types. Uh, and one of them, uh, there's certainly that's the sort of area that they do not approve of. And, they, and I think they lose a lot of their member support when they do things like print the social security numbers and home phone numbers of police officers and that sort of thing. There's this whole wing within Anonymous that has gone off on this anti-sec um, movement, which is anti-security, it's attacking not just defense contractors for political reasons, but also through garden variety law enforcement. Um, so when you're experiencing that, who are they targeting and why? Well, if you're talking about that wing, that wing of Anonymous, uh, you know, again, if anyone can belong to Anonymous, anyone can propose a given operation and maybe it gains support and maybe it doesn't, maybe it gains a little support. The folks that have gone after defense contractors and the like, um, part of that is that they feel they're, they're part of the, the bad stuff that's happening on the internet. Uh, increased monitoring, reduced privacy, that sort of thing. Um, some of them don't like uh, US, uh, US national politics overseas. Um, you know, it, a lot of it seems to be against uh, sort of Western, Western governments. Um, and there's probably a reason that a lot of this, uh, a lot of these operations have an infrastructure that's hosted in Russia right now. I mean, Russia doesn't have a problem, um, you know, uh, helping out uh, groups that are attacking, you know, Western powerful interests. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, the, the, the attacks on, um, on innocence, like BART writers, has cost them, uh, has cost them some membership, I think. And I think the, the folks on that, the, that are more aggressive on that sort of thing, one of their defenses is, hey, this gets us media attention. And when we get more media attention, people learn about the underlying causes, and maybe they'll join some of some of the movement. That that's the defense that they offer. Let me pick up on something, Stefania. You said a few moments ago when you were talking about the generational differences between the older hacktivists and the younger ones, and you talked about hacker ethics. Yeah. Now, some people watching this may scratch their head and say, "Didn't realize these folks had any ethics." There are hacker ethics. Yes, yes, the, 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 there are several items in this headaches if you want, so it's difficult to now uh, provide a compilation of what would be in there, but uh, generally speaking, it was uh, an attempt by the hacker movement to come um, find a compromise between the fact that they, can, they could actually be pretty powerful in terms of using their expertise to break into someone else's privacy, for example, or uh, you know, security networks and so on and what, uh, what are the boundaries, right? So uh, what is legitimate or what's not legitimate uh, tactic to adopt at a certain moment in time? 
Barrett, you want to follow up on that? Was it your sense when you were part of Anonymous yes. that there were actually a, there was an ethical code that you were following? Yes, and, and you know, just in a sense, you know, when something like that happens with the release of uh, information of innocent people, a lot of people in Anonymous get unhappy, and some of them will leave the movement. I think that's uh, I think that speaks well of the constituency that makes up Anonymous, because you don't see that same kind of uh, that ethical discussion. You don't see that wariness in so many of our opponents, such as the intelligence contracting industry. Uh, you know, as Joseph Min knows, uh, as a famous incident now in February of this year, uh, Aaron Barr, uh, a CEO of an intelligence contracting firm called H.P. Gary uh, Federal, came to him and said he had discovered our leadership by infiltrating us, and then Anonymous hacked him the next day, hacked his servers at his company, and took 70,000 emails, and what was discovered immediately was that he and two other companies that are allegedly respectable were planning a, a number of clandestine and very amoral uh, very, very dangerous uh, campaigns uh, against activists and against even journalists and WikiLeaks on behalf of corporations. And I've, I've been reading through these emails ever since uh, in an effort to better understand this industry, and I, I've only seen one occasion in which someone has, in that industry, has stepped up and said, hey, is this wrong? Is this something that we should not be doing? And, uh, you know, it is, of course, again, it's, it's important that we, that Anonymous maintain a higher ethical standard than our opponents and then, than, than governments do, uh, and then, then does most of the population of America, the, the ones that, that will support anything done by their country and by the military. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's worth looking at, you know, what, what Anonymous has done good versus what has done bad, and then comparing that to those of our opponents in the tra traditional infrastructure of the world. Gabriella, does it seem to you, we know, we know the official law enforcement authorities so would like to have at them, but does it seem to you as if they are policing themselves well enough? Well, it, it is hard to police anonymous um, because anyone can call the name, and yet it's also the case that if you can't get consensus for a campaign, it falls flat on its feet. Um, and in that sense, there is a little bit of kind of coherence and order within anonymous. I think I'd also like to address this issue about um, generations and ethics and hackers. Sure. Because in fact, what's interesting about anonymous is that you know they're not all 16, 17, or 18. There's uh, a number of who are in their 30s, which for hacking is a little bit of an older generation. And whether it's hacking back in the 80s or hacking today, there's always been different kind of ways of hacking. And hackers are quite sectarian. And so free and open source software is a form of hacking that's quite vibrant today, um, and yet is quite different from what happens in anonymous. And so in, in any one period, I think that there's, there's always been sort of legal hacking and transgressive hacking back in the, the 70s, the 80s, 90s, and today. So I'm not so sure Anonymous is about different generations, um, but there's obviously different moments where transgressive hacking gains a new sort of traction and visibility, and Anonymous certainly brings that to bear today in different ways. And Joseph, how about official law enforcement avenues? Are they getting a handle on any of this? Well, you know, actually, to some, yes, uh, to, to, not to the extent that they can arrest all the people that are participating, though they're, they're, they're certainly picking up a large number of people who did nothing more than participate in alleged denial of service attacks, uh, which Barrett referred to as, as DDoS uh, attacks, DDoS, uh, stands for Distributed Denial of Service. Um, but more impressively, they've, the UK police, Scotland Yard, has arrested now what they claim uh, are three of the four founders of LOL Security, uh, or LOL Sec, uh, which, which has done nothing but attack uh, uh, big companies and uh, police and, and government organizations. And it's, it, you know, we have no who's been convicted yet, but uh, they probably, you know, they're, um, uh, if, if they are correct that they have the right people, that's fairly impressive that they got those those top guys, uh, low security. It's the same group that attacked HP, Gary Federal, uh, and Aaron Barr, and have done some of the, the more dramatic, uh, some of the more dramatic attacks. Um, in terms of getting a handle on it, they're spending a lot of time on it. It's a big priority for the FBI um, because they've never seen anything like this before, where it, you have criminals, um, you know, and part of what they're doing is criminal, whether you agree with the politics or not, um, who are using this mass mass medium, these new mass media, to uh, distribute stolen stock uh, and attract supporters. I mean, it's, you, you would understand if you're, you're on national law enforcement why you'd be pretty worried about a group, some of whose members say, we're going to attack the CIA next, 
they actually do deny, they do a denial of service attack on the CIA's website, um, and they distribute tools for doing it, and it, it's, it's you know, merging crime and politics. That's a pretty scary thing if you're law enforcement, so they're trying to understand it. And Eric, is most of Anonymous in the United States, or do you even know? No. I would like to hold you there, and I do not know how many individual perspectives have you picked up, but I, I believe it is an excellent interview. It's a very good follow-up of the documentaries that we saw on Monday. So let me give you an example of how you can discover the meaning out of it. About two weeks ago, okay, um, in Hong Kong, white movement was in the heat of the unveiling movement. The students occupied central Africa in Hong Kong. Um, the anonymous group jump in and they produce some kind of website. Okay, it's very interesting. They, they, they spread out that if you, one of the individuals in Hong Kong or student in Hong Kong, support this movement um, of doing things, you can just come to a particular website and press the button. Okay? It's just like pressing a button. But, and then a couple of the college students and the individual citizens in Hong Kong was immediately caught by the police in Hong Kong because the police are looking for individual people who go to that particular website and kick off that button. And there's a button somewhat like sending the Lanyo service, the distributed denial service attack to an individual website in Hong Kong. And by doing that, it's just like they set up a site where a lot of cyber weapons are there. And they invite individuals who believe they support the movement to go to kick on the cyber weapons. And when you press the button, it's just like holding a gun and pull the trigger. Okay? And then the police, with a very interesting law in Hong Kong, they took actions. They arrest individual students. And then all in a sudden, the students who would say they never do anything by following the instructions of doing that. Because in Hong Kong, it is not as free as in the United States or other countries. By doing that, you will be caught by the police and charged with very serious criminal offense that is not worth it. Now, they just come to this point here, okay? When you try to put things into perspective, uh, first of all, you need to know what is meant by the hackers and what is meant by the activists. When the hackers and activists become one in the cyberspace like this, they have created some very interesting, powerful phenomena. An example you saw in the documentary of last Monday is how they took on the Scientology group, the cult group, in, in, in different regions of the world, in the United States, in Canada, in uh, uh, Sydney, in Israel, where you name it, in any famous. And today, in this interview, which we have just watched about half of this, and you, you have the several key figures, the scholar who studied the activist group Anonymous, uh, several journalists who follow up the stories there, and one of the former members of the activists came to put things into perspective for you. Now, I think if you study this story in this interview, in a documentary we saw you on Monday, definitely if you're interested in doing that, I'm sure you have already encompassed one of the six important post many outcomes there. And then if you go to the, uh, the PBS front line, okay, they have all the documentaries that will give you more evidence of what you can make of it. Now, things like this could help you understand how to formulate your own ideas and express your views, and also raise your awareness of this kind of phenomenon. Now, what is the key issues behind this? Information security and privacy, think about this. What example have they mentioned in this interview, which was done by the anonymous in San Francisco Bay Area to the Bach station, the Bach company? The Bach company in San Francisco is just like the mass railway transit system in Hong Kong, okay? Gong team, okay? What they did is they attacked the system and took all the personal information of the customer and they reviewed them. No one welcomed things like this. And so, they follow up with questions of, is there any ethics behind this? And interestingly speaking, they say they do have ethics. But Anonymous had one very interesting thing is that they all agree Anonymous is not ours unanimous. That means people would not
not say yes to everybody's idea. They allow differences. But even though they allow differences, if someone within the group have done something bad, other people might left that group. But they might remain anonymous beyond uh, in, in others, uh, kind of actions. So I think that is a very interesting follow-up. Um, having said that, I, I, I would let you explore them. I, I, I cannot consult you all because we need to take care of other agenda in the class. So let me come back to our class and see how many of you would like to do the team-based sharings today. Uh, let me see. Um, for Devin's team five is of last time, right? So we have 10 teams here, and as of last time, we have uh, a number of teams. So I'll give you five minutes to uh, work on yourself. In the meantime, uh, wait for the volunteer teams who would like to share today. And I remember several teams promised they would do it today. So don't miss out the chance, all right? Don't miss out the chance. Now I'm giving you 10 minutes time to organize your teamwork, and then I'm looking for your response here to tell us which team you would like to share today with a maximum of 10 minutes. And in the meantime, allow me to take attendance for today. All right, so you have at least 10 minutes time to work together to organize yourself before we come to the team-based sharings. And hopefully we got some sign up. If not, we'll do the lucky draw, all right? Kalia for today, thank you. Prolia, Natia, Ada, thank you. Andy Lerm, thank you. Ryan Ball, thank you. Uh, and then Jenny Yu, thank you. Jackie Wong, Jackie, thank you. Wai Pang, thank you. Uh, and then Sihon, Sihon is not here. Manfo is not here. Bittritz, thank you. And then uh, Fish. Thank you. Angela, thank you. And then Erika, thank you. Vivian, Vivian, not here today. Ruby, thank you. Uh, C, thank you. Elisa, thank you. Loka, thank you. Okay. Stephen, thank you. Terrence, uh, I think it's excuse. Winnie Earn, Thank you. Tom, thank you. Dixon, thank you. And then Woody Hole, thank you. Gideon, thank you. All right, uh, Friend, thank you. Michelle, thank you. Annie Merrill, thank you. Uh, Cindy Choi, thank you. Neon, thank you. Uh, Ryan Lamb. Thank you. Lester. Thank you. Kelvin. All right. Uh, Gaia. Thank you. Uh, Hanson. Yes, thank you. Jessica. Thank you. Tiki. Thank you. Chen Yu. Thank you. Uh, Iris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any person whose name has not been called. Now please work among your team members and in about 10 minutes time, I'm going to see if we got some sign up today. If not, I'm going to do the lucky draw. Okay, we got the sign up of team number seven in a minute. Okay, you still have about five to six minutes time to work together as a part of the team to organize yourself. And make sure that by this time, you should probably have your team wiki ready, all right, to so show us. Okay. Make the best use of this classroom work time for your group members. Second last day in the month of October, and next 
week we're stepping into November, and uh, November is the last one of this semester, and you start to have work in your learning portfolio, okay? So after the free learning contract, you should have produced some artifacts, and used the artifacts, and particularly depending on the choices of your four out of six course intended learning outcomes, you're going to build up your personal learning portfolio for this course, in the very last one of this semester. And that represents the work, which is traditionally considered as your final exam. But we don't have final exam, we just have your learning portfolio, all right? So it's very exciting. And individually, you have your own choices. Uh, what to choose, what to work out. We are April and holidays, four teams today, and we just have one team, team number seven, okay, and team number five done it on Monday. So we are going to lucky draw three more teams, okay. should be ready because you just have one more week to do that. So we have eight tags here. We're going to invite team number one, two, three, four, six, eight, nine, ten to come down here to pick a tag. We have eight tags here, so we have eight teams here. But out of the eight tags here, only three has the keyword present. So you have three out of eight chance to get it. So we invite team number one to send out one representative. Team number one. Team number one, okay, thank you. All right, did you pick one tag? No, 
nothing. Okay. You give it back. Okay. Now team team number two. <laughs> team number two. Yeah. Would you please pick one tag? Anything? Nothing. <laughs> right here. <laughs> team number three. Now we have uh, fewer chances of getting empty. Okay. Nothing. Wow. Team number four. Team number four. So we're going to have bingos now. Please pick one. Yes. Present. Okay, could you pick put it right here? Team number four present. Team number six. Okay, could you please pick one here? Present. Okay. Team number eight. Now we have one in three chance to get a, a presentation token. Okay, could you please pick one? Nothing. Thank you. Now, these two have 50 50 chance. Team number nine. Team number nine. Yes. Okay. Present. Okay. And so, team number 10, you don't need to present. So now, the first team is team number seven. The second team is team number four. The third team is team number six. The fourth team is team number nine. Okay, you have five more minutes to get yourself ready. Five more minutes. And then we're going to invite these four teams to come down here.
seven. You come up here, give number seven. Okay? So do you need to use the computer? Okay, you can lock me out and lock yourself in. Okay, can you start by using the microphone? Hello, Hanson. Uh, so, uh, in my proposal, uh, the topic is about hacking and cracking. Uh, the three questions about to find out the advantage of hacking and cracking and also the disadvantage and and also how to protect ourselves when things like this happen. Uh, the reason I want to do this topic is because uh, as what we learned, we know not every hacking is bad because uh, some of them are paid by the company, some of the hackers are paid by the companies to hack in the system to find out the problems of the system in order to uh, improve it. So uh, I think we should know more about this. Uh, and also we uh, we should know how to protect ourselves. This is important because I don't think anyone would like their uh, personal information to uh, leaks out. So we should learn more about these things like this. So this is my proposal. And here I'll talk about our reading list for the week 8 to 10. As we need to work on our journal every week, we need to choose our own topics for, uh, for uh, in the reading list. And here we have the topic, what is wireless network security? What is the ethical issue of in hacking and cracking? What, is compu what are computer crimes and uh, what are the countermeasures? And here uh, I've choose topic, what are computer crimes, and Erica has chosen the topic, what is wireless uh, network security, Hansen uh, has chosen what are the ethical issues in hacking and, cra hacking and cracking, and uh, Loka has chosen what is countermeasures as her topic. And here is our uh, team wiki. And we have prepared the uh, meeting minutes. And we met each other uh, on the 18th of October in the library of University of Macau. And the duration is uh, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And uh, all of us were present. And we have discussed about um, our job allocation and Beatrice is the leader and uh, Loka and I are <coughs> the secretary and also the timekeeper and Hanson is the communicator and we have chosen our proposal and uh, which belongs to Hanson and that is related to our uh, to the silos and we have confirmed and uh, our topic chosen and uh, which was mentioned by Beatrice just now and we have discussed about the topic sentence before we write the journal. And we have decided to meet again on the 22nd, uh, on the 22nd of October. And let me say uh, the next minutes. We date in 22 October and the duration is 6 to 8, uh, 2 hours. And we are in library University of Macau and all of us. And the panel is discuss over what to write in our journals and search for the definition of, in, of 
in the in um, in the Noah's network, security com computer crimes, and uh, do search on the types of computer crimes, uh, identity threat, hacking, screen, computer um, focus. Uh, do search on various network security, provide some example, and um, provide expandance on all the topics. Um, Final is, is discuss about the uh, uh, schedule of the next minute. This meeting is date uh, 29 October at uh, University of Calgary. Uh, as we have reached each other yesterday and uh, we have started working on our journal, uh, we have uh, checked each other's journal and give opinions to each other. And we will start working on our proposal as we need to change some of the questions uh, in order to fit the silos. And, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, team number seven. Uh, keep going with your good work. May I invite team number four now to take the center stage to help us understand more of your work. Team number four. <coughs>
number will be used in the next retake. This is our second meeting and all of us had a look at other members' proposal already. Therefore, we start to choose a board for the topic for learning contract free. We name a member for the sixth proposal. One, what is information literacy? Two, what is information security? Three, what is IT? Four, what is digital device? Five, what are the ethical issues of cracking and hacking? Six, what is information threat? Each of us use one to two minutes to explain our own topics in the learning contract one. In order, in order to refine others, the same, the same with the, the contract in learning number two. And then we have a voting from this sixth topic, and we have a result that what is information literacy and what are the ethical ethical issue of cracking and hacking and what is information from have the same mark. So we have around two voting for our learning contract three and and the result and the final result is what is information from is our learning contract three topic. And our next meeting, this meeting will be on today, and we will have a decision about our learning contract three. Thank you. Thank you, team number four. <laughs> we welcome your work, and please keep up your good work. Now we invite team number six. Before our adjustment for the 
uh, Tim Rose and and we discussed on the uh, priority of the works like uh, replace our replace um, uh, we we decided our uh, we do we do our own individual work like uh, writing a journal or something individual works uh, from last week to the to Tuesday and we decided the following days will uh, the focus will be on our group work and Because we are still focusing on our own work, but I think when we are writing our journal, you have some idea of what should be right in the proposal. So we have a Google document for us to write down those pieces of idea when we are writing our journal. And the reason why I use Google document is I think that it's more user friendly than the wiki in the Google. <laughs> It's fine. You can link it to the Google document from inside your wiki. That's uh, that's one way to compromise. And I'm going to talk about the. And we have to discuss the team proposal and analyze analyze all the proposal and decided to come up with a new proposal for learning contract break and then discuss on the topic of the new proposal analyze the, analyze the two silos for learning contract break according to the topics of the week matching and decide the topic is using encryption to fight against internet three. Discuss when to when to finish the proposal. We'll use Google Documents like Elisa said and I'm preparing my journal. And we will uh, put our own journal uh, on the uh, team discussion forum and every one of us can give comments and we will uh, make some improvement uh, for our individual uh, on a journal. Yeah. And yeah, that's all for our... Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Team number six. Now uh, is the time for team number nine. Also, it's also contained team number 10. So would you please get ready and help to give us some more information on the work in progress in your team number nine, uh, including team number 10. Please make sure you use the microphone, turn it on and speak into the microphone.
every time we we talking about the credit card problem, uh, the reason why we chose this problem is because we all have no credit card. So we want we want no more information about the credit card. And I pass. <laughs> Please speak into the microphone. We cannot hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah. we have bigger our own topic like this. Um, well, let's see, let's work. This is uh, my uh, topic. Um, others have their topics. Um, like this. Is also is the privacy. Uh, this week we maybe have one one meeting on Saturday or Sunday. <laughs> okay, uh, but remember, kindly be reminded your team or both team together should choose two signals to start with, okay? You must choose two signals before you choose your own topic. So that is a very important reminder. Anyway, we thank you very much for your team's effort in helping us to understand more of your work. Okay, thank you very much.
All right. Um, it's almost time to end today's class. But kindly be reminded that I was reminded next Monday is a holiday. All right. So we miss next Monday. You do not have one more chance to share. But we're going to meet next Thursday. Okay. So in between, if you have any questions, you can ask me questions on the documents Q and A online this week. Okay. And I'll try to get. Thank you very much for doing the in class sharing. And I hope each one of you should keep a record, okay, in your personal journal when you perform, when you do the sharing in the class. And count the number of times. Do you have at least up to 10? Alright? If you have 10, make sure you capture the video record from YouTube and then tell what you share in that period. Okay? Ten records are very important. And I hope most of you will have five to six at this point, and you will have four more during the first learning portfolio stage. Okay, and it takes up 20% of your final grade. So you need to do some sharing. Alright, that's it for today's class. Welcome back next first day. Okay? Alright, see you. That's it for today's CISG 113 Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Until next Thursday, stay in tune.